Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, in our brand new study uh, by Edgar Sheffield Brightman, his Philosophy of Religion, <coughs> written in 1940 and published by Prentice Hall Press in New York. And we begin with uh, Brightman by taking a look at his methodology first in pages 1 through 31. And as we go through this, you're going to discover that he is more or less outlining a phenomenology. In fact, he even uh, mentions Hegel. So he kind of outlines a methodology as a phenomenology, which he calls empirical and non-scientific. He calls it empirical, but non-scientific. Let's begin with block one. And we begin uh, by noting that uh, Brightman says religion is a phase of experience and human knowledge begins and ends with experience. Science and philosophy are interpretations of the movement of this experience and their aim is to define the order and the coherence of our sensory experience. Philosophy itself seeks to construct a comprehensive unity uh, in interpreting this experience. Now, Brightman says that three schools of thought must be negated. The a priori thinkers, he said that uh, <clears throat> they distinguish between experience and reason. Experience equals data. Reason equals principles. Truth is independent as a priori truth. But he said that human observation makes this notion false, and it must be negated. Next, the logical positivist. They distinguish between, between experience and reason, reason, between logical propositions and factual propositions. Logical propositions equal the principles of logic, and the true is that which is verified by sense experience. It's negated by the notion of human consciousness. And the Bardians, reason and experience cannot be trusted for religious faith. The value of reason is only to make revelation clear. Experience cannot be trusted. Therefore, revelatory truth takes priority for Bart. But Brightman says we must negate the a priori thinkers, the logical positivist thinkers, and the Bardian thinkers. And he says he wants to justify his own empirical method. And he says that uh, it demands the survey of all the facts that have a bearing on the subject. And uh, he will define all presuppositions. He will ask for the meaning of verification, and he will examine the claims of revelation. He says that religious knowledge arises in our consciousness experience, and it is tested in consciousness experience. Wisdom must pursue the open-ended path of empiricism. He says that the three schools that we want to negate do give us three perspectives. You've got rationalistic belief, skepticism, or supernatural religion. So it does give us three perspectives, and he will address these in his empirical method. But uh, he wants to distinguish between empiricism as scientific method and empiricism as non-scientific method. There's a distinction. Experience is chaos until it is studied scientifically, but he says the scientist also does learn to identify objects and to use language. Next, the scientist will seek understanding of the hidden forces within experience. Scientific method, method relies on controlled observation. That leads to laws of nature, and they are enlisted to attain desired ends. He says the science of religion includes history, psychology and sociology. So those are non-scientific fields of study. 
They don't employ scientific method. So his philosophy of religion will enlist history, psychology, and sociology. Basically, uh, he will address the non-scientific area of consciousness, feelings, and thoughts and belief. And he says this method is more inclusive than the scientific method. It's the precondition of science. And it is evidenced by the concepts which he will address, those being purpose, systemization, and value. Purpose, system, and value are taken up by his philosophy of religion. So he says it will be an empirical methodology, but a non-scientific methodology. And primarily he makes this claim because it deals with human consciousness that fits perfectly with what we know today as phenomenology. It's beginning with sense experience, however, taking up the realm of human consciousness and human understanding. In other words, phenomena. So that's his initial posited methodology. And now we're going to take a look at block two and take a look at religion as non-scientific. He says that scientific experience is descriptive, but it does not address experience of value. Non-scientific experience asks the following. What is better? What is right? What is beautiful? What is holy? It takes up evaluation, and that is non-scientific. Evaluation will include the aesthetic and the religious. So, it's the evaluative consciousness that moves us out of the realm of scientific method. It is evaluative self-consciousness that is taken up in Breitman's methodology. Empiricism with evaluative self-consciousness. And he says that uh, in note two, we can formulate a preliminary definition of religion as a hypothesis, it must be descriptive, it must be distinguished from science, from philosophy, from morals, and from social experience. Religion is concern about supreme value that includes devotion and expression and a set of beliefs. Religion is concern about supreme value, including devotion, expression, and a set of beliefs. I think that's a very good definition. And he says that... Uh, in note three, we will be dealing with a systematized knowledge. It is empirical. It does begin with observation of experience. It addresses psychology and consciousness, that evaluative self-consciousness, history and development of beliefs, and sociology and group phenomena. So that's the non-scientific field of interest within the empirical method that distinguishes a philosophy of religion from scientific method. So block one, Breitman proposes empirical methodology. Block two, Breitman proposes non-scientific interest. Non-scientific interest, so empirical methodology, non-scientific interest. We're going to go beyond science and beyond scientific method in his approach. Now in block three, Breitman tells us religion and its enlistment of philosophy is examined. He gives us a, a preliminary definition of philosophy, and that is to understand experience as a whole. There's interest in the unity of experience. It posits the questions of end and of value. The questions of relation between value and ex existence. And then key for this entire methodology is the concept of the real. This is going to be critically important to understand. For Breitman, he says our key concept is the real, and that's the holistic view of creation, the holistic view of existence and the universe. So philosophy attempts to discover the coherent and the unified definition of the real. It wants to discover the coherent and the unified 
holistic definition of the real. That is key for understanding Brightman. And his philosophy of religion is like philosophy in general because they both deal with ultimates, but it does differ because it does address concern, devotion, worship, and conduct. But they have the same object, the ultimate unity of reality. Religion posits a practical attitude. Philosophy posits an interpretive attitude. Therefore, key conclusion, religion enlists philosophy as the objective basis, basis for its faith. Philosophy provides an objective basis for the positing of faith. It gives us that coherent and unified definition of the real out of which we posit our faith. And that will lead us to the concept of theology in note 3, 3.3. Three. Philosophy of religion seeks to discover the, discover the rational interpretation of religion. It addresses truth of belief and value of practice. Truth of belief and value of practice. It seeks to define the re relation of religious values to experience. It critiques value through the lens of the interpretation of the real through the interpretation of the real. The holistic thought picture of the real allows us to posit the concept of value. And theology is natural and based on, on reason, or it's revealed and based on revelation. It always addresses God and redemption. Now, key, because he has emphasized the concept of the real, it should be of no surprise that in, note, in block 3, note 4, he's going to bring up Hegel. Because Hegel's philosophy of religion sought to discern the principles at work in religious history. A movement of religion is a movement of a historical force. He says Hegel was an empiricist, comparing the aspects of religious history with the whole of the real. He, found, he finds good foundational contributions from Hegel. He finds a good beginning there because it addresses this concept of the movement of history as a movement of the real from which we can discover the positing of Christian or religious value. So we get a tremendous what Brightman calls his orientation for the project. Chapter 1 is titled Orientation, but we could call it uh, methodology, or we could call it his outline of phenomenology, because basically he's given us an outline of his phenomenology that he will approach for the entire project. And it's a 500-page project. It's a fairly large philosophy of religion. But the outline we have here Today, we know that we call this phenomenology. In 1940, it was called personalism or personalistic philosophy. And uh, Brightman was the bright star of American philosophy, a Methodist uh, theologian and, a, and an American philosopher. Not all significant philosophers are German. I mean, you know, it seems like they all come out of Germany. However... America has a strong, powerful philosopher, Christian philosopher, and Edgar Sheffield Brightman. And we are privileged that the first lesson is always the most important lesson. We are privileged that he has given us an outline of his methodology as a phenomenology. His methodology or his orientation is a phenomenology. It is empirical method, it is non-scientific interest, and it is theological history. There's your recall triad. Empirical method, non-scientific interest, and historical theology, or theology of history, I should say better, theology of history. An empirical method, a non-scientific scientific interest, and a theology of history are going to make up the outline for a phenomenology that Brightman will use to articulate 
an in-depth philosophy of religion. That's going to give us our introductory lesson. And uh, now we're all looking forward to examining a powerful Christian philosopher in Edgar Sheffield Brightman.